In the next series of lectures, I'm going to talk about different types of reactions. And we're going to go over five main categories that I'd like you to be aware of and comfortable with identifying, uh, and some of them predicting their products. These are reactions that we'll use all throughout this year in chemistry. And while many of these types of reactions will go into lots more detail, right now we just want to make sure everyone is aware of the types of reactions that we'll be utilizing in our lab and also in our conversations about chemistry in general. The ones that are going to be a little bit more in depth later on will be acid-base reactions. We'll spend a lot of time in Chemistry 162 talking about acid-base reactions. We'll also go into a lot more detail with redox reactions when we learn about electrochemistry. So let's start. Uh, we're going to talk about double replacement reactions, or they're also called precipitation reactions, then acid-base, then gas-evolving reactions, then oxidation reduction reactions, and lastly, combustion. So precipitation reactions. These ones are really fun. You take two clear solutions that are homogeneous, you mix them together, and suddenly a solid appears. These are precipitation reactions, or double replacement. What we're doing is we're combining um, a number of ions that are soluble in water, but once we kind of bring all these ions from different places together, there's a combination of them that is insoluble in water. And so the appearance of this is that this solid just either falls down to the bottom of your flask while you're pouring, like this image here shows, um, or that it just suddenly appears in the solution. Sometimes it looks like nothing happens, but then you notice there's these chunky crystals at the bottom. It's really fun. And a, well, okay, a lot of them are plain white powders that just make the solution look milky or cloudy. Um, but some of them are really colorful. And one of those is uh, a reaction that produces lead iodide, which is shown here. So in this case, if we mix up in one beaker a solution of potassium iodide, it'll be totally like soluble, it'll be a homogeneous solution. And then we mix up a, a second beaker that contains lead nitrate and we dissolve it in water. And it'll be a homogeneous solution. It dissolves completely. And then once we pour these together, we're introducing into the same system lead ions and iodide ions. Now, lead and iodine form an ionic compound together that doesn't break apart in water. And so if I, I had a pile of lead iodide and I added water, nothing would happen. I would have a pile still at the bottom of the beaker. But when I bring those two soluble ions together into the same space, in the same Erlenmeyer flask in this case, then they form a solid when they come in contact, when they collide with each other, and then more collide into it and the solid builds. And what you see is this like beautiful golden yellow powder just appear out of nowhere. And that right here is the lead iodide represented here as our solid within our solution that still contains lots of water, obviously, as our solvent, but then also the potassium and the nitrate ions that didn't form a solid, that are really soluble in water still, even with lead and iodine and potassium around. Nitrate will be soluble. So we're going to talk about predicting the products of these, and we're going to talk about deciding which ones will turn to solids and which ones won't. And we use a, kind of a, a rule set that uh, allows us to predict whether or not a precipitation will, will happen. And again, this is another one of the ones we'll talk a lot more about, uh, this time in Chemistry 163, when we talk more in depth about solubility equilibrium. But we have a lot of compounds that are ionic compounds that have uh, really strong ionic bonds. And these are going to typically be. Um, well, not typically, but a, a lot of times it's when they have higher magnitudes of charge between the two ions and they come together. But uh, for whatever reason, and we'll talk about that in more detail in 163, uh, they're not as soluble. And solubility is kind of a spectrum, so maybe a little bit dissolves. But for the most part, they don't dissolve in water. And we've kind of built this summary of rules to help predict which ones that'll be, rather than always running and looking up an equilibrium constant for the solubility of that solid in a table, which is another way to predict when a solid would form. 
but we're gonna call that outside the scope of our kind of foundation setting for the year. And so then there's this rule set here on your screen and it's kind of broken up into two sections typically. And it's always going to be these compounds that are generally soluble, right? Followed by compounds that are generally insoluble followed by exceptions. And so the way to read this table is lithium, here I'll highlight, lithium, sodium, potassium, and uh, ammonium form soluble compounds with everything. And the exception to that is that there isn't an exception. So if this is one of the ions in a compound, it will dissolve. Now, uh, the way to read it when there is an exception is something like chloride, bromide, and iodide, they always form soluble salts. They'll dissolve in water, with the exception of being paired with silver, mercury, two mercuries, and lead. So if I have something like silver chloride, this will be a solid in water. But if I have something like sodium chloride, because that sodium isn't listed in my ex uh, exceptions, I will expect this to be aqueous in water, that it will dissolve. Similarly, on the bottom half of this table, I would read this as uh, anything with hydroxide or sulfide, it's always going to be insoluble, unless our exceptions are, unless it's paired with lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium. So that means that something like calcium hydroxide will be insoluble or a solid in water. But my exceptions tell me that lithium hydroxide will be aqueous or soluble in water. And so that's how you read this table. Um, and you know the way this class is structured, you don't need to memorize this table. You just need to know when to use it and how to use it. So sometimes we'll combine two different uh, solutions of salts dissolved in water and a precipitation won't occur. So this is uh, no reaction in terms of a precipitation reaction or it doesn't happen. So not all of our combinations of salt will produce a solid or combinations of solutions will produce a solid. Uh, and so we'll walk through the way to predict this, but here's an example of that no reaction. If I combine potassium iodide with sodium chloride this time, nothing would happen. And here's how we tell. And this is my first, this is my rule set for referring to it later when you're working on homework problems. So think of this as a reference slide. So whenever we want to decide if I combine two things, will I get no reaction or will I get a precipitation reaction? I'm going to go through this set of um, steps to determine that. So first I'm going to determine which ions are um, each aqueous reactant turns into. So for our no reaction example, that was going to be potassium iodide would become potassium plus iodide. And our sodium chloride would become sodium and chloride. So I'll have these four ions in solution when I combine the two like solutions that I've made up. Next, we determine the formulas of the possible products. Um, and so this really just entails exchanging ions. So if these are my reactants, um, what I'll do is I, I already know that potassium iodide, when potassium combines with iodide, it's already soluble. So if I, I wanna consider if potassium combines with chloride, my new possible combination, will it be soluble? And I know sodium when paired with chlorine is gonna be soluble, but what happens if sodium and iodide are together? And so what I wanna do is ask myself, when I exchange these ions, what will happen if I form potassium chloride? Is that soluble? And what happens if sodium iodide forms? Is that soluble in water? Now, when I, when I kind of exchange ions, I'm always gonna make sure I balance their charges, just like we talked about with um, predicting the ionic compounds that form between ions. And I'm gonna make sure that I have a charge neutral compound. And then I'm gonna to go to my solubility chart and I'm gonna determine the solubility of each of these products. And I'll use the solubility rules. So the way I would do this for this one 
going to be back up to our solubility rules. So for potassium chloride, I'll look up my potassium ion. I'm like, oh, found it. Also, here's chloride there. Found that. Okay. Well, both of those are going to be soluble generally, and potassium doesn't have any exceptions. And in the chlorine row, its exceptions aren't potassium, so that's going to be soluble. So we can look at that, and our potassium chloride will be soluble. Great. Now let's look at our sodium iodide. So what happens when we have our sodium and our iodide come together? Well, I'll come and I'll find my sodium right here and my iodide here. Same story, both of these are going to be soluble without exceptions that include one another's. So we'll be aqueous here too. So that's how I know I'm not gonna have a reaction is when I look at my solubility rules, I see that everything that could possibly be produced in my, my reaction mixture is soluble in water. Now, if I looked those up and one of them was insoluble, then I would say I had a precipitate. And then I would have a precipitation reaction or a double replacement reaction. I'll then write out my reaction. I'll make sure I have the appropriate phases, aqueous if it dissolves in water, solid if it doesn't. And then I'll always double check and make sure that I have a balanced equation at the end. So let's walk through one. Here's another example of one that's gonna happen that we just looked at with potassium iodide and lead nitrate that actually did produce a precipitate. So again, we're going to take our, we're starting with uh, potassium iodide and we're lead nitrate. And so we break those up into the two ions that would form. We'll have lead plus two, and each of these nitrates is minus one. Our potassium is plus one, and our iodine is negative one. And we can predict this from the periodic table. For something like lead that might be able to have more than one possible charge, we'll be able to determine it from the number of anions it's paired with. And to get that charge for the nitrate, I would probably use my polyatomic ion chart. So now we swap ions, right? We do an ion exchange. This is the double replacement part of the reaction. And then I predict what we would have. So instead of potassium being paired with iodine, now I'll have potassium nitrate. I take the cation of one, the anion of the other, and I bring them together. And then the same happens with lead and iodide. We bring the opposite, a cation and anion, bring those together. And then we go and look at the solubility rules. Now at that point, we'll see that lead iodide is predicted to be a solid when in water, whereas potassium nitrate is predicted to be aqueous. So then we can write that chemical equation, oh, not there. We can write that chemical equation completely as potassium iodide plus our lead nitrate will produce potassium nitrate plus lead iodide. And we know that both of our reactants were aqueous. And uh, we learned from our solubility chart that our potassium nitrate will be aqueous and our lead iodide will be solid. Now I'm gonna balance this. I can see already that I need two iodides to pair with my lead, so I'll need two potassium iodides. And I have two nitrates in my lead reactant with my lead nitrate reactant. So I'll have two nitrates to work with, so I need a two here in front of my potassium nitrate. And then I have a balanced precipitation reaction where I predicted the products. Now lastly, I wanna point out that there's a couple ways to write these actual reactions. So we wrote out the chemical reaction in the previous slide, but we can also look at something that we call the complete ionic equation and the net ionic equation. So the complete ionic equation takes a precipitation reaction and we have one right here that we're looking at that's uh, potassium hydroxide and magnesium nitrate combining to form potassium nitrate and magnesium hydroxide. And that magnesium hydroxide forms a solid. So a complete ionic equation takes all of these ionic compounds that we've said are aqueous and represents them as they are in the solution. And that means that those ions separate because they're completely dissolved. So I can really think of this potassium hydroxide as two potassium and two hydroxide ions that are separate from one another and surrounded by water molecules. And that's what you do for all of the aqueous ionic compounds in the equation. You split them up into their ions instead of pairing them up into an ionic compound. 
Now we keep the magnesium hydroxide as a solid, since it's a solid, we keep that written as a chemical formula because it hasn't broken the ions up in the water um, because they're not dissolved. And so that remains the same. Now, taking this a step further, we could report the net ionic equation for this precipitation reaction. And what this does is it focuses just on the ions that are undergoing a change in their phase, essentially. And so anything that is soluble in the reactants and soluble in the products isn't changing by mixing them together. They're still just surrounded by water molecules and that's it. And so we can ignore them. We're like, well, that's not really participating in the reaction. Now, what is participating in the reaction is anything that is soluble in the reactants and then a solid in the products. That's undergone a physical change that we can see typically with our eyes. And so in that case, we can just cancel out anything that's the same on both sides of our net ionic equation. So I have a potassium on both side, both the reactants and products side of that arrow. And I have nitrate on both the reactants and products side of that arrow that are aqueous. And so I just cancel them out. Kind of like when you have an algebraic expression, you're simplifying. If you have two of the same variables on either side, you can eliminate them. And so then that just leaves are like the, the things that are doing this new chemistry, which is the hydroxide ions and the magnesium ions forming magnesium, magnesium hydroxide, sorry, solid. <laughs> um, and so that would be our net ionic equation.